So it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce Michael Nichols, who uh, you know, basically you're going to do a quick intro about yourself and then the background and why you're here today. And by the way, um, it's so funny, we, we, we spoke yesterday and, and uh, you know, the fact that it's September 11th today, it's, uh, you know, we, we said, you know, all the stars are aligned uh, since Michael has spent, you know, quite a few years at, at DHS uh, and he's going to talk to you about some of the, uh, you know, some of the consequences and his, some of the stuff he's done. All right, it's good to be here. I know you guys have had a long work day, um, but if you bear with us, maybe you'll get something out of this. Um, I uh, left the Department of Homeland Security in uh, the end of 2016, or say September 2016, right before the elections. Uh, prior to that, I was the chair of the communication sector. I was the chair of the Network Security Information Exchange. Uh, I was the um, chair for an organization that brought together the CEOs of uh, defense, IT, and comms. Um, that would be like Juniper, AT&T, Sprint, uh, Microsoft. The CEOs actually work together with their uh, technical people and they produce reports to protect the country and provide those to the president. Um, prior to that, I uh, worked in building infrastructure protection across the 16 critical sectors. And uh, from a technical standpoint, CISSP, um, for years, uh, during the dot-com era, we built networks uh, for NEC and MCI and AT&T. And, and so I've been in this thing for a while. Uh, now, I have a nonprofit out of Kennedy Space Center, and we build cyber threat information sharing organizations. And I uh, also have a for-profit um, that does cyber, secu um, cyber security. That's me. Great, so we should, we should pay attention, right? Yes, that's, uh, um, so talk to me about a bit about, um, you know, some of the you know, pitfalls and you know, uh, efficiencies, uh, challenges in the government space, especially, you know, in the area of cybersecurity. So in the government, most people don't know it, but there's a real strong public-private partnership going on. Because in reality, the private sector owns everything. Um, the cascading effects will come from what happens in the private sector. The innovation comes from the private sector. And so uh, a lot of companies find an advantage from being in that space, and it's a trade-off. And I can tell you the truth about everything now because I don't work for the government anymore. <laughs> but uh, a lot of the companies that are in that space every day, they're there to get an advantage. But because they're there, it makes the nation more, more safe. Um, when it comes to telecoms, um, the NCID, uh, National Cyber Security, Security and Communications Integration Center, they have access to the CEOs of all the um, telecommunications companies. Um, as, a, as I said, the Microsofts and the Junipers, and you name it, the Ativos, they're, they're all there every day. And so that's what provides us the advantage. And so when I go around talking, I talk about the public-private partnership and I talk about the communications. And just like you're all here tonight, I kind of been watching you, you know, it's a meetup and you're here learning stuff, but the greatest advantage that you're gonna get is to communicate with each other because at some point you're gonna need each other. It's, it's only getting worse about that. <laughs> Good, thank you. Um, so, you know, tell me, you know, maybe uh, as, uh, you know, as you know the reality of the government, maybe if you could have changed one thing um, in terms of how, how the government approaches, you know, cybersecurity, what would that be? So, um, you'll find me consistently now talking about a lack of leadership. So, if you notice, there is no face of cybersecurity. How could that possibly? There's no face of cybersecurity. You could have previously said that uh, Admiral Rogers at NSA was the face of cybersecurity. Um, he's gone now from there. And he really wasn't. NSA is not really your connect with the community, connect with the network security professionals. Um, and because of that, 
And because of how the government has failed in producing that thing or that person, that star that everybody looks towards, it leaves us very vulnerable. And what I mean by that is, let's say, for instance, we had 500,000 network security people that were capable. Well, they're not the problem. It's all the people that work in your organizations who have access to things. It's the people who are out on the street who are third-party vendors who have access to things. It's now the physical aspect that makes the, uh, the uh, logical piece very difficult. And it's the interchange between them which is only going to get worse with the Internet of Things. Um, so, going back to your question, the government, um, there's a role of government, and there's a role that's not government role. Um, the government is not coming to save you, is what I typically say. I'm actually writing a book called that. Government is not coming to save you, right? And so, within the private sector, these heroes, these people, these beacons have to emerge, right? If that does not happen, it leaves room for these cascading effects, which are going to be the thing to do you in. So you said, you know, I'm in New York City, going to do this, millions of people here. But this city is big enough, and there's enough going on here, where if we have, uh, I have to say if we have a cyber 9-11, which I, I had a video today, which I talked about, in order for us to have a cyber 9-11, it would have to be as horrific as 3,000 people dying, 600 people hurt, and millions of people uh, suffering the consequences, right? Well, pretty much, nobody's going to drop a nuclear bomb on us. However, through cyber security, through um, cyber exploits and through a cyber attack, it could happen. And so the government is sort of not making this cybersecurity thing at the front and center and making even regular citizens go, you know, I need to learn more about that. That's a problem. So I'm going to get you to uh, the book signage uh, session, you know, maybe uh, once the books come out. Um, so what's, what was your, uh, your crown jewel of achievement uh, that you can recall from, from your time at DHS? So um, in 2012, uh, I did a uh, national security uh, risk assessment with the telecom companies, the, um, some IT companies, satellite companies. Comcast, those kind of people, all the people associated with communications. And that was important because they're all regulated. I don't know if you guys know it, but for some odd reason, not for an odd reason, it's because of money, right? <laughs> um, IT companies are not regulated, even though, like Google Fiber, they're trying to do telecom. But telecom companies are regulated. And so to get them to participate in a risk assessment would expose things are an issue. They were concerned about the White House and the FCC taking that risk assessment and then regulating them. So what I did was, and this is a technique that you could use within your companies, I got the White House, the FCC, and other regulators to participate. So on the front end, all the people participating knew who the customer was. The customer was actually their regulator. And the idea was that we would all work together to fix the issues prior to reg when regulation could ever occur, because it's a long and arduous process, and nobody really likes to do it. Right. Um, and, you know, we see like on, on, on the news like almost every day, you know, these, these um, you know, uh, fake news and all kind of like you know election you know stuff that happens you know how much of that affects the, the government and the government decision in terms of how to to approach cybersecurity? So a couple of aspects. I was uh, this was kind of what made me leave the government and go out and start building cyber threat organizations uh, and work with the government inside the government. I 
couldn't say anything that they didn't want me to say. Yeah. It's my job, right? That's the issue that most of my former colleagues have. Um, I was sitting in a room in July of 2016 with some senior people, and they thought that there was some uh, exploits that were being carried out across the country in different areas related to the elections. And the conversation was more focused on who do you tell, when do you tell, what are going to be the optics of that? It was a very political, it was a technical thing, right? But it was a political discussion. That's the problem. On the other side of this, the national election system, most people don't realize that if you Google national election system, you might find one thing about cybersecurity. And that had to do with some case that was brought against them about release of information. Outside of that, the states, by law, to elections. And the states, even over the last year, do not want to give that up. And so, even when DHS wanted to make elections a critical sector, you guys know there's 16 critical sectors, comms, IT, water, uh, chemical, they are critical sectors. And they wanted to make the election system a critical sector. A lot of states pushed back. So, the message in that is, outside of just all of us working together to protect everything, there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff going on. For instance, if somebody's attacking our election system, isn't that an act of war? Right? Well, the only NATO Article 5 says that if a NATO country is attacked, everyone comes to their rescue. Maybe you guys know it, maybe you don't, but over the, during 9-11, God, this keeps coming back to 9-11, um, there were NATO planes flying over the United States. This never happened before, right? How cool is that, right? We're all working together. Um, cybersecurity, essentially, there's a cyber war going on, right? But we don't really define this, so we purposely don't define the word cyber war. So at some point, if you're trying to protect the network of a company, you could be going against a country. That's pretty tough. <laughs> Just saying. It's, uh, it's rough out here. It's getting worse. <laughs> Okay, uh, well, I'm glad I had a drink afterwards, but um, <laughs> and I apologize for uh, memorizing. Uh, you, you know, guys remember Sony? No, sorry, go ahead. Sony was going yeah. against a country. I thought the government just uh, basically, you know, they answered that it for basically. Okay, so that's a good, one. <laughs> good conversation. So, yeah, they just did. But guess what? That was 2014, and Sony lost. Half of their data, we'll half of their computers, they had to go out to Best Buy, because we were working with them. They had to go out to Best Buy and buy computers and laptops to keep the company going, right? Which means that you definitely have, you don't have the security that you had previously. And part of it was they had no culture of cybersecurity, and they, when they found out that there was something going on, they didn't share the information which actually made things worse for them. And it kind of leads me to, you know, it's a great segue to the next question is that, um, and I ask that a lot for people that uh, come here, is that, you know, you've seen a progression of, of cybersecurity in industry and government in the past couple of years. What, what has changed? And then if you could, you know, if you had a crystal ball, you know, cybersecurity crystal ball, what would you predict in the next, you know, two to three years? So, I predict that there is going to be a major outage, and that major outage is what's going to make us come together and do some of the right things. We use, for the internet, TCP IP, right? So, we know that everything's going to work, right? We get on there, there's a system, right? For some reason, with cybersecurity, the biggest companies there are, you have to understand, they're in Washington every day, just pounding. They don't want any kind of regulation, right? They call everything regulation, but it's 
really the development of standards, right? And so I believe that we're going to get some standards, but it's not going to happen until after there is a certain amount of damage. Right. And it's almost like having seatbelts after. Uh, right. After the and at intersection, three people have to be killed before we'll put a stop sign on. That's kind of the reality of this. And then, you know, further that, I would say, you know, sometimes they take into account that some people are going to get killed and they don't put it into it. That's, that's uh, right. right. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question and let me open up, uh, you know, for crowd participation. So, you know, I looked at the background, it's awesome. Like, you, you led some, some committees around, uh, you know, cybersecurity, uh, SMB, preparedness, uh, you know, supply chain, uh, you know, protection plan, and, and cyber, cyber, cyber infrastructure response plan as well. You know, typically people don't have access to, you know, to these committees in terms of what, what's happening there. And I don't know if you can provide a glimpse of, of uh, you know, what these committees do and then how, you know, what's the kind of findings and how does that affect the, uh, the decision making afterwards? Okay, so if you're not familiar with, for instance, us-cert.gov, I would get familiar with that because it's sort of the front door to a lot of stuff that happens in the cyber center at DHS. And pretty much things that happen at NSA and NIST, they're all funneled there also. Um, when, in your in DC, there are interagency meetings, all of those same organizations are meeting and working together every day. Um, but there's all kind of opportunities for experts to participate in these committees, to have input, but it's just that most people, when I leave outside of Washington DC area, most people don't even realize it. But all the big companies do, right? They all make sure that they have somebody there that they're paying to be there to slant whatever's going to occur, right? And so I have to slip this in, I'm sorry, but in some cases, when we should go left, technology goes right, it's because that's where the venture capitalists decided to go. You know, um, it's, it has a senior person from Alpha tell us that. It's, it's just, that's the way it is, right? And so we don't always get the best practice and the best of the best in our approach. Um, and that's why I talked about those heroes locally who have to decide that not on my watch, right? In my environment, I'm gonna create a culture of cybersecurity because in the Washington, D.C., you know, um, DOD is protecting the nation against nation states, and DHS is responsible for the cyber threat information sharing and the partnerships, and NSA is, you know, discovering the zero days and working, you know, through DOD, and NIST is supposed to be developing standards, right? And then they're all supposed to be working together. Um, but in the midst of that, and when we talk about critical infrastructure, to an individual or to the company that they work for, right, isn't that their critical infrastructure? Right? So it's sort of the, all those inner workings and all those things that can funnel out and help us to be more secure don't necessarily protect you on a daily basis. Last question. Um, a bit of a plug. You know, maybe you can tell us why you're writing a book and, uh, you know, what's the message, like the underlying message of, of what you're trying to do? So, I'm writing a book called Secure Cyber Life, and the government's not coming to save you. It's just the most amazing thing to me. I thought I was doing such a service to the country. And as I travel across the country and I talk to people and organizations and experts and um, people who run huge organizations, it's amazing to me how disconnected they are from what's going on. And it's one of those things where, in if you're running a program in the federal government, you're not incentivized to come back from Congress and say, this isn't working. You're incentivized to spend all the money in that program so that you get the money again next year. Um, we've got a lot of contradictions. And so with those contradictions, most of the people in this nation have no clue what's going on. And so at a minimum, I'm trying to not necessarily talk to the security experts, but I'm trying to talk to the people who work in your companies who are going to be the person, the, the junior administrator, 64%, um, are the cause of breaches, errors that they make. Or I'm trying to talk to the people who work there who care 
but they don't really get it. They take the little IT compliance test, but they don't really understand how that affects their livelihood, the company's livelihood, and how this one little thing that they're doing is going to have an effect on the company. Um, the whole little test they used to do with the USB and you throw it across the fence and somebody picks it up, it still works, still works. Although now they're doing a little test where they take the USB, they put it on a conference room table, and they put that USB on a conference room table, no matter how much training you've given people, they always stick it into the system. <laughs> and they go back and they ask, well, why did you do that? And it's human nature, which is what most technical people forget about. We're all humans, right? They always say, I just wanted to return it to the right person. Okay, I was thinking about doing this for bang, maybe. Hello, Kitty on it or something. Um, that was great. Um, so maybe I'll open up, uh, you know, for questions. Anybody has some questions to, to my point? You, so you know why they did this with kids, right? Because it was too easy for the adults. It says everything. Yeah. I mean, that says everything. But I thought the other really important part of that was when we think about the election system, we always think about hacking into the machines. We forget about all the components that make up the supply chain, right? I used to tell people, uh, I was at the Homeland Security Institute for a while, and I used to tell them that if we were talking about telecom and ones and zeros, you don't have to take the system down. All you have to do is disrupt it. I spoke to APTA a couple of weeks ago, American Public Transportation Association. That's all the big transportation systems, right? And I was explaining to them that they could be the cause of our elections being ruined. And they were looking at me like I was crazy. And I told them because if they are hacked in a way that disables their system, people can't get home and vote. Right? So we've got to broaden our view of what's going on here. Okay, so he's asking, uh, how is it ethical that um, the government is asking security providers to provide a backdoor? Again, another one of those contradictions. One contradiction, the government partly funds TOR. TOR gets you onto the dark web, but it's for a reason, right? So that the government um, can have contact with dissidents and people that are in places that help protect us. Back to your question. The contradiction is, can you imagine if we had no access to anything this thing, it, we're already in a wild. So, right. So it's this push and pull. I, this is not. It's not my opinion about what we should do. But I'm just saying, this is the problem that we have. Your the benefit is that you live in America. The problem is that you live in America. No, right, it is. Nobody tells you what systems to deploy. There's no real regulation. There's some for banking and other things, but. You have the opportunity to take risk. And so, because of that, the government teeters depend on what administration is there, on whether we need to have access and have sight of what's going on or not. Plus, it's for your own safety. Yeah. <laughs> Just get with the program. <laughs> Stop. Stop. Come on. Got an NSA guy over there. Yeah, last question. Uh, yeah. yeah, go over there. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, he was asking that, what about if we had some type of standard for voter benefits, all of us, um, for voter security, and then start with, say, Washington, D.C. as sort of a test or a pop -up. Well, over the last five months, there's been two or three groups that have been set up. So there's now a government group with all the government agencies that have to do with the elections, and there's an industry group. Um, it's, they made it a critical sector. States don't necessarily want to participate, but it's there. Um, they're working together. Harvard University stood up something, and you have some, you have like Microsoft and Facebook, and some of the bigger companies are all participating. So there's two or three different efforts going on right now. I think before they get to the pilot stage, they're at the point that they're trying to just align the troops. Um, the vendors who make the various machines, um, they're starting to come together because they're realizing that hmm, there's a greater risk of us not doing this. So 
it's it's starting to happen, but I'm with you. Isn't our democracy, almost like our lives, our lives are like the most important thing, right? Isn't our democracy the next most important thing? I mean, and on the vendors, there's foreign ownership of vendors. Right. That seems to be something that is an urgent emergency. Again, welcome to America. And until there's regulation, until there's a government hand, going back to the question about, you know, the encryption and so forth, you can see, you know, that sometimes it's, you need a government hand, right? And that decision just hasn't been made. Okay, so we're out of time, but uh, Michael is going to stick around, right? So thank you very much. Help me uh, welcome. Uh, thank you.